Hello, everyone. Welcome to Practical GCP. In today's session, I would like to talk about the difference between ETL and ELT and the design of a transient data warehouse. So uh, I would like to change the style a little bit today. So usually, you know, I will probably go through documentation and show you some examples. But today I would like to instead, throughout the session, I would just draw um, the concept and the design. I think for this, this particular topic, it's probably easier to, uh, to talk about it this way, to make it a bit more interactive. So first of all, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about ETL, right? So as everyone knows, the ETL is kind of a quite traditional way that you know, designing a data warehouse process to get data from other places and transform it and then load it into a place for con consumption. So these stands for uh, extract and transform and then load, right? So the, the concept here is typically you get data from the party system somewhere else, you do your transformation, make sure it's kind of cleaned up and then put it into the right place, then you load it to the plate, then you know, send it to stakeholders for consumptions. And so I'm not entirely sure why this phrase is still really rapidly referenced uh, these days when kind of people talking about uh, designing their data systems and or data warehouses because most people as far as i know are no longer doing etl so instead they're doing elt so there's actually there's a really big difference between the two so the etl process you extract and start doing quite a lot of transformation and then you load tools for stakeholders or consumers to use but the concept of uh, elt is actually the opposite. So you typically get data extracted first, right? You, you, let's say you have these systems in here and then um, you run some processes to get the data out and you put it into, you load it into this place, which typically you probably want to call landing or data lake. Um, and then that data is typically not transformed, right? This is a very big difference. You, you don't actually transform it first. So it's not actually transformed. So you just load it in there in the first place. So in the GCP context, this would typically be either GCS or BigQuery, depending on what you actually need or whether it's structured data or unstructured data or semi-structured data, the storage engine typically people use here would, slightly be, would be different. But in this case, let's say you use BigQuery as example. Uh, you typically get the data out from this third party system, which can be APIs, right? And it can be databases, right? And then you get these data out and you typically put it into here without any transformations. Um, and then after you've done that, you would introduce your T layer, right? This is your transformation. Um, and this T layer is where all of your logic would come in. A landing layer or the, the data lake layer can be pretty messy, right? So it, it will have data that is probably not the best quality. It will have data coming from the source systems. But one of the key things is, is matching the source. So this is, let's say if your source system has uh, uppercase columns or underscores or whatever, um, in my opinion, you wouldn't change that, right? You match exactly what is, where it comes from. If it has a table called something, you would have a matching table name here. Uh, you, you have a matching column name called in here. You may add some metadata such as the, the ingestion types and things like that, but you would not you know, just map that into something else, right? To a different column name or add any logic. Um, and but one very important thing in here in the landing parts, right? When you load it is to follow a set of conventions. So obviously you don't just want to load them to all over the place, right? You still want to define your own convention to make sure whatever that comes in that follows the, uh, the convention that you want to standardize in this layer. So all of them then look the same. So in BigQuery, you probably want to have the same as uh, data set, uh, sorry, project data set and table conventions. Uh, so they're all kind of following the same format. Um, then, then in this case, it's much easier 
to to con consume right later on. But one of the key things is you don't actually add logic into here. So you don't say, oh, if this happens, do this, or if that happens, I'm going to convert this column to something else. So that's the typical difference between the two different approaches. Um, the T layer here is where the really heavy, all of the heavy logic happens. Um, and then after the T layer, you, you would end up having uh, your, in this case, data warehouse, right? Then we, from those data warehouse, you can, you can build things like, you, you can do build different data maps, right? Data maps one, data maps two, data maps three, and so on. But then these are for, uh, you can have stakeholders consuming the data warehouse directly into here for some of the use cases. And then you have other you know, stakeholders consuming data from there, right? For different business section, sectors or use cases. Before I talk about the, the concept of the transient uh, data warehouse, I would first of all like to talk about why, well, even people are referencing ETL quite a lot these days. I do not think they are doing ETL for a number of very good reasons and why you probably wouldn't want to do that if you're still doing it. Is first of all, when you get the data from third party systems, right? This process is typically quite simple, right? You get data, it is extracted in different format, Avro, JSON, FAT files, or CSVs, whatever, right? And then that gets uh, put into, into, into your system. Uh, if, you, if you apply a lot of logic in here, then what would happen is you've actually changed the data at the time it comes in. If you then load into a system, what if something goes wrong in the process, right? The, the, I'm not saying that extraction process can't go wrong, but this is typically, this typically has no logic. If you start introducing logic in there, things can get really complex, right? So if you just have, a, let's say, a JSON payload has six thousand columns, that's really simple, just, just load into a database. If you start putting logic in there with if else, and then case wins, that's where things get really complex. And if something goes wrong, one of the typical things that would happen is you, you the, the developers are maintaining this process because they've transformed the data, they would go to the upstream system, say, hang on a second, this data doesn't look correct, and you fix it. And the people from the, the maintainer side of things in the upstream system and say, hang on a second, it, doesn't, it looks correct to me too. So then they ended up with a, with a debate because they're saying, oh, you guys already transformed the data uh, and then it's not a problem. So these guys can't easily prove it because you know, the code is there, but the data is already loaded. So they can't see the exact, um, the exact version of the, the data, right? When it comes in. So, and often these problems don't appear straight away. They could appear after days or even weeks. So you, you wouldn't normally keep that data in the, in the traditional approach because you already loaded everything to, um, to, your, to, your, uh, to your data warehouse and serving to the stakeholders. So the, the logic layer uh, is really not, in my opinion, serving anything that is useful in here. So that's where it comes into the ELT use case. So with data coming in, you wanna keep that layer as thin as possible, right? So in some scenarios, people might say, oh, you, you can't always do it, right? So due, due to reasons such as compliance privacy, you might have to convert data from uh, you know, might need to unmask some of these data fields. You might have to do some mapping because the data is actually in a really bad form. It just can't be loaded for whatever reason, right? And then, so in some of these scenarios, you have to do a little bit of uh, tidying up before this data can actually go into your landing on data lake layer. Um, but that is something really, really uh, simple and really, really lightweight. And typically what people call this, right? If, if there is something that's happening, it's a, it's, it's a lowercase t, right? It's a tiny t that happening in here before the data gets loaded into the landing layer. So that, that is the kind of typical things that with very small logic, maybe you add some metadata columns, but it's very, very lightweight. You definitely don't have business logics going on in there. Um, and then, okay, so let's draw a line here. So everything in this box, right to the left. Everything in this box is your EL layer, optionally with a tiny T in the middle, 
but definitely not a capital T with lots of logic going on, like the, how the things are traditionally designed. Okay, so let's move on. So what do I mean by the transient data warehouse design? So as you can see, now your data is kept in here. So all, all in the landing layer, right? You could have lots of data come in. So in a big query scenario, typically data is partitioned by ingestion time, and then it doesn't get deleted unless due to reasons that by the law, like GDPR and other use cases, right? So, but this data that you don't actually go back to yesterday or the, a week ago or two weeks ago, you keep changing it. And that typically doesn't happen unless you have to, do the, have to do a backfill in some of the scenarios. But typically if the thing is correct, the data is correct, you don't actually go back and touch it, right? So that is typical increment, typically incre incremental. You get more data in here, this gets bigger and bigger. But again, still, no heavy logic, very lightweight stuff, but no heavy logic, no business logic. Now this is where it comes to the T layer. So the transformation in the process can be very complex, right? Keep in mind, this depends on the quality of the data in the organization, which in my opinion, I've seen many variations of different versions of all sorts kind of things, right? That are coming into here. And this is really typically very complex to get into you know, a, a data warehouse where you have clean data that for consumption. So this T layer, in other words, is extremely complex with lots of business logic all over the place. So there's tools like, for example, DBT. So DBT gets used quite a lot in the recent, I would say last couple of years by more and more companies. Uh, this is open source tool. If you haven't heard about it, I can probably uh, have another session to talk about it uh, if you're interested. But this is basically a uh, the tool for the T layer, right? It doesn't actually do anything else. It's just a tool for the T layer. And it models the data in a way that you're using a, a, a directed acyclic graph, which basically means a graph, uh, a directed graph with no circles. You can't actually go backwards. So data flows in one way. Um, and that has a lot of benefits. Um, but the main thing I want to focus here is the T layer is complex. And then you build your data warehouse. Then later on, the data warehouse, you, you have data mass on top of that for different uh, use cases, right? On top of that. So this is where it gets interesting. If the T layer goes wrong, because although you didn't do it earlier, right? In, let's, uh, let's go up here. You didn't actually do it in the ETL process in, in this T, right? You, you, you didn't actually, you didn't do it there. So let's say I crossed that out, you didn't do that, but you still do it, you are actually doing it afterwards, right? You're doing you do it afterwards. So what if this goes wrong, right? What if this goes wrong and this data is corrupted and these data were then corrupted on top of that? And how long would it take for you to fix it? Right, these are the things you need to consider when designing those systems. How about if we change our mindset? Instead of thinking that this is permanent, right? How about this whole thing, the T layer produce is transient. So what I mean by that is it's not just data gets disappeared tomorrow and then no one can use it, that kind of stuff. Is you, you, you have this mindset of this T layer can be rerun, right? You can rerun the T layer and then you reproduce this entire thing in here. So this entire section here, let me move around a little bit, right? Oops. So this entire section here, consider it's something you can totally rebuild with a click of a button. So it's fully automated, right? And probably not even a click of button. It will just, you know, let's say you do it every week or do it every day, depending on the amount of data you have, depending on area you wanna run those kind of things, right? So if this is easy to rebuild, then why would you worry about the T layer so much if that goes wrong, right? If something goes wrong here, you can easily reproduce it and then make sure everything from that time onwards is automatically corrected. So in my opinion, this is a really, really important thing. I even call this a disaster recovery process, but it's a disaster recovery, recovery process that gets exercised quite, quite often, right? It could be a weekly thing, it could be a daily thing, but the key is your logic here is 
is is is reproduce is you can rerun the logic in here and then reproduce everything that your uh, users consume in a short period of time. In the past, this probably has been very difficult, right? So before the world of distributed computing, um, you you want to reproduce this whole thing from your you know from 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 the the data you have, which are probably even in the old days you're talking about tens of terabytes, right? Without distributed computing, this is going to cost you a fortune. Right? It's, it's it not just the time, not just the money it, it, it will cost you, but it will also cost you a huge amount of time to reproduce. It could, you could be running for days or even weeks before you can do this. But with the power of distributed computing, more specifically, this T layer, let's say you're running on BigQuery, right? You, you have all of the distributed computing power to scale this up and down depending on how much resources you need. Because the, one of the previous sessions I mentioned that uh, BigQuery, you can, by default, you go into this on-demand pricing, which you get, I think is about 4,000 slots that you can run the, run new things in there. And it can only get processed so much data in, uh, in you know, you get so much, so, so much slot. But there's also the thing called the flex rate, which you can, um, you know, I believe it's a 60 second billing that you can go up to uh, whatever slots that you want to purchase for a short period of time, like 60 seconds. Uh, let's say you use it for an hour, you reprocess 100 terabytes to a 500 terabytes of data, whatever that is, and then you scale it right down, right? And then it will only cost you a fraction of usually how much it would cost you. So that is the power we have these days. So there's not much point of you know, trying to design this so carefully, and you have to get it exactly right. But instead, you try to build your T layer as fast as you can. You give your stakeholders data, you produce your stuff, something goes wrong, you just rebuild it, right? Obviously, there's lots of data quality things and testing you need to put in, in as part of this pro T process. But the, generally, the, the iteration is so much faster because you don't really have to worry too much about if something goes wrong, because you can just fix it, right? So this is a really important thing to keep in mind. That's the, the because of the distributed computing power we have these days, the approach is totally different to, you know, how things used to be 10 years ago. Uh, just a little touch bit, a little bit on the DBT side, because DBT gives you um, this kind of capability to run um, a DAG, that links all of your transformations logic together and it's just only SQL, there's nothing else, right? It's just SQL. Oops. Yeah, it's just SQL. So this will link all of the SQL scripts together and it's actually very simple. It's also mostly select statements, right? So you just basically link all your select statements together as a directed graph, you produce your data warehouse, you produce your data mask, you give it to stakeholders. Something goes wrong, you can just basically um, let it rerun take all of the logic in there, right? And then reproduce your entire transient data warehouse of data mounts. So that is extremely powerful concept, in my opinion. At last, I wanna just mention this T layer in terms of where do you store this logic, right? So if you use DDT, you do not have a choice not to put the code in version control. So standard VCS version control systems, right? So that's like a, you know, you can use GitLab, you can use GitHub. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what that is or Bitbucket um, to store your, you know, your code permanently on, our, on, this, on these vendors. But the key is these are no longer magic, right? In the past, a lot of these, um, the tools that people have been using has this user interface based T layer that is not storing uh, those, uh, how can I put it? Those uh, code. Well, these are code, right? They, they these are SQL, but they're still code, and it can get really complex. So, if you put them in a in a third party system that you don't have version control, you don't know where this thing is, you don't know you don't know how to roll back. You can't roll back. You can't automatically do deployment. You can't do code reviews. So, version control is probably in my opinion, one of the most important things that needs to be applied to this T layer to ensure you have facts all over, all over the T layer. If something goes wrong, you can go backwards, you can go forward, you know, fix things, rerun things, code reviews, collaborative as a team, 
uh, to produce your 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 uh, the the asset in here again, right? So this is the things I would like to you know to talk about today. It's really important that you think in the way that is uh, how modern computing uh, works, and then utilize uh, the power that we have these days, and make sure we design a better system that give us so much flexibility and cost us so much le less time to design and maintain. Okay, that's the end of the session. Thank you very much. See you next time. Go, go, go out.